Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. The conspiracy of the strange deaths of several scientists who all worked for the Marconi Group was thought to have a connection to the United States Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as the Star Wars program. However, in recent years, an even stranger conspiracy has emerged, one that suggests the deaths were indeed suspicious, but they were connected to top-secret work involving an intelligent alien substance, one that the Falklands War helped to cover up its discovery. This extraterrestrial liquid became known by those researching the claims as the Black Goo, and those claims stretch in several intriguing directions. The Black Goo conspiracy sounds like science fiction, and what I'll share with you are some of the most bizarre and unsettling claims of recent times. But in this case, we might just find that fact is indeed stranger than fiction. I'm Darren Marlar. And this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… The Freemasons, the Knights Templar, the Skull and Bones. Secret societies are already ripe for conspiracy theories, but what about the theory that they are also tied to extraterrestrials? We have our own opinions about aliens and what their intentions might be. But what do the aliens think about us? And what do they think our intentions are? If one scientist is to be believed, it isn't flattering. But first, is an alien liquid invading our planet? We'll look at covert operations, suspicious deaths, and what appear to be intelligent substances, all of which are being kept a secret from us. We begin there. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. Beginning in 1982, a string of highly suspicious deaths took place, involving scientists that appeared to have a connection to the Marconi as well as the Strategic Defense Initiative, otherwise known as the Star Wars program. In total, between 1982 and 1990, over 20 scientists were discovered dead in more than mysterious circumstances. What follows is a brief summary of just some of those deaths. In March 1982, for example, 45-year-old Professor Keith Bowden of Essex University was driving his car when it went off a bridge, landing in an abandoned rail yard and killing him instantly. Perhaps bizarrely, his death was listed as accidental, with police asserting that he'd been drinking alcohol on the night in question and had lost control of the vehicle. His family, however, rejected the suggestion, as did many of those who had been with him on the night of his death all of whom stated he had not consumed alcohol that evening. Even stranger, when Bowden's family hired a solicitor to investigate Bowden's questionable death, it was discovered the tires on his vehicle, which were almost always new or recently replaced, had seemingly been swapped with a set of tires that were worn and passed their best. 
just over a year later, in April 1983, 49-year-old defense expert Lt. Col. Anthony Godfrey, who was the head of the work-study unit at the Royal Military College of Science, simply disappeared into thin air. Despite repeated search efforts and attempts to lure him out of hiding with huge financial rewards, he has not been seen since. In March 1985, 49-year-old radar designer Roger Hill, for reasons unknown, took a gun to himself and ended his own life. At least officially. Eight months later, in November 1985, 29-year-old digital communications expert Jonathan Walsh would seemingly fall from a hotel room while working on a British telecom project in the Ivory Coast. What perhaps makes Walsh's death even more questionable is that he had expressed concern for his safety in the weeks leading up to his death, and furthermore, he was involved in secret research for his employer. Walsh's death remains a mystery. A similar death occurred in August 1986, when 24-year-old computer software engineer Bimal Dajbahai, who worked for Marconi Underwater Systems, was discovered dead underneath Bristol's Clifton Suspension Bridge, a fall of over 200 feet. Interestingly or not, the death was not ruled a suicide and still remains open. What made Dajbahai's death even stranger was the fact that he was found with his trousers around his ankles and a needle-sized puncture wound in his buttock, perhaps suggesting some kind of incapacitating drug had been administered. Only two months later, in October 1986, another computer analyst, this time for Marconi Defense Systems, 26-year-old Ashad Sharif, was discovered decapitated in his car. From the scene that greeted investigators, it's claimed that Sharif tied a rope to a nearby tree and the other end to his neck and then drove away, resulting in the horrific fatal injury. His death was ruled a suicide. However, when a relative was asked to identify Sharif's body, they noticed that there was a metal rod on the floor of the vehicle next to the accelerator. It appeared to them that the rod had been used to press down on the pedal, causing it to drive forward with the likely unconscious Sharif inside. Several months after that, in January 1987, Richard Pugh, a computer consultant with the Ministry of Defense, was discovered dead with rope wrapped around his body, including four times around his neck. Bizarrely, despite the obvious suspicious nature, his death was ruled accidental due to a sexual experiment that had gone wrong. In the same month, another Ministry of Defense employee, John Britton, was discovered dead in his car as it sat parked with the engine running in his garage. As opposed to suicide as we might expect, though, his death was ruled as accidental. A month later, in February 1987, another engineer employed by Marconi, David Skeels, was discovered dead in his car from alleged carbon monoxide poisoning. In the same month, two more suspicious deaths were reported. One of these was Victor Moore, who died from an apparent overdose. Another was Peter Fiapel, who, like Skeels, was reported to have died from carbon monoxide poisoning. His death, however, appeared to his friends and family, as well as to the police who arrived that morning, to have been far from a suicide. On the night before his body was discovered, Fiapel had spent the evening with his wife and some of their friends. When they arrived home, he left his wife in the house while he went to put the car in the garage. The following morning, after she realized that her husband had failed to come to bed, Piapel's wife discovered his body, jammed under the car, his mouth close to the exhaust pipe. The way the body was found caused police to suspect that he had been placed there as opposed to having positioned himself there. Several weeks later, another Marconi employee, John Whiteman, was ruled to have accidentally drowned in his bathtub after taking a mixture of medication and alcohol, both of which were found scattered around the bathroom. However, autopsy reports showed no signs of drugs or alcohol in his system. In March 1987, yet another Marconi scientist met with a sudden and tragic end. David Sands was driving his car, which for reasons unknown was jammed full of cans of petrol, when he suddenly turned his vehicle and drove into an abandoned roadside cafe. The car exploded immediately, leaving Sands to be identified by dental records only. The following month, 24-year-old Mark Weisner 
was discovered wrapped in plastic bags with cling film wrapped tightly around his face. In a similar way to Richard Pugh, it was determined that Weisner had died through sexual misadventure. In May and June of 1987, two scientists from Plessy recently purchased by Marconi, 22-year-old Michael Baker and 60-year-old Frank Jennings, were discovered in questionable circumstances, respectively. The following year, in mid-January 1988, 23-year-old Russell Smith went missing from his home where he lived with his parents. His car was eventually on a cliff top with a note inside it. His body was discovered at the bottom of the cliff. At the time, details of the cause of death as well as what was written on the note were not disclosed. Several months later, in August 1988, two more strange and particularly horrific deaths occurred. Firstly, 50-year-old computer engineer Alistair Beckham spent a Sunday afternoon attending to his garden. Following this, according to the official version of events, he then went into his garden shed and attached a series of electrical wires to his chest. He then is said to have pushed a handkerchief into his mouth and switched on the power, apparently electrocuting himself to death. It was Beckham's wife's opinion that her husband had not taken his own life. She would state that not only had he become increasingly secretive about his work in the weeks leading up to his death, but in the hours following his discovery, several men who claimed to work for the Ministry of Defense arrived at his home. They insisted on searching the shed and left with several documents belonging to Beckham. A similar but even more grotesque death awaited 60-year-old John Ferry, who proceeded to attach electrically charged wires to the fillings in his teeth before switching them on and electrocuting himself. The deaths of these scientists, then, are without a doubt suspicious and amazingly strange. Can they all be explained away as mere conspiracy theories? And if so, just what was the dark hand that seemingly orchestrated such apparent killings? None of the scientists had any known contact with each other, and yet some deadly piece of string connected them together. It was noted by many who researched the case that several of the men had allegedly committed suicide in particularly violent ways, certainly using methods that were out of the norm from those who choose to end their lives. Furthermore, it was highlighted how the deaths that were explained away as sex games gone wrong were a favorite of the espionage world, and certainly suspicious here within the context of the other deaths. Even more concerning was that many of the men had complained to their families and close friends of the unrealistic and unscientific nature of their work tasks. Perhaps even more alarming was that several of the scientists had officially left their respective jobs and were working out their notice periods when they died. There were also several questionable deaths of scientists in West Germany who also had connections to the Strategic Defense Initiative, with one scientist being killed by a bomb planted in his car. Even stranger, several scientists with similar connections to the SDI program in Italy and Sweden also died in suspicious circumstances. For their part, British authorities shrugged off and dismissed the notion that something untoward was taking place, with one Defense Ministry spokesperson saying the idea was like something straight out of James Bond. And while there was little press coverage at the time, and certainly little that would connect these mysterious deaths, when viewed retrospectively as we've just done, a very worrying picture builds up. By the late 1980s, many of the killings had already occurred, though several investigative newspapers, both national and international, began questioning the deaths and highlighting such connections as the Strategic Defense Initiative. Was it their work with the SDI that resulted in their untimely deaths? We should note that there are many who have claimed that the technology of the Strategic Defense Initiative was the result of reverse engineering of alien technology. This would undoubtedly have put those who worked with it in a precarious position. Marconi has always refused to publicly comment on the strange deaths, which, rather than distancing themselves from the allegations of foul play, has almost tied the company to them even tighter. However, some researchers have since suggested that it was not the Star Wars project that connected these unfortunate scientists, but rather their involvement with something that has never officially been acknowledged. The deaths of the Marconi scientists are without a doubt suspicious. 
However, whether they connect to the SDI program is open to debate. According to some, the truth of the matter is a lot stranger and even more ominous. Scientists' work with the SDI program may have been a cover for the real nature of their work, and it is to those claims where we will turn our attention next when Weird Darkness returns. My doc agrees that I need to lose a few pounds. I knew that going in. But he also told me that the meds I'm taking for my type 2 diabetes aren't going to do me much good if I finish each meal with ice cream or cheesecake. I kind of knew that in advance, too. But cutting back on carbs and sugars is, is a lot easier said than done. I've tried a lot of protein bars while on the road, but I swear it's like eating non-sweetened, chocolate-dusted particle board. But now I travel with Built Bars. Built Bars taste like candy bars. In fact, I'm now using them for my dessert. And at about 150 calories per bar, less than 3 grams of sugar, up to 19 grams of protein, I can satisfy my sweet cravings guilt-free. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash built and try a box. You can go for a variety pack of several flavors to try or pick and choose to build a box of your own. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built. Scientists' work with the SDI program might have been a cover for the real nature of their work. The connection that some researchers have highlighted is an apparent alien substance discovered, coincidentally or not, in 1982, the same year that the Marconi conspiracy began. According to the basics of the conspiracy, the real reason for the Falklands conflict, or certainly something that was going on behind the scenes of officialdom, was the discovery of an intelligent alien substance. The substance was said to be a deep black color and has since been dubbed by researchers and investigators as the black goo. One UFO researcher who has investigated the black goo conspiracy is Miles Johnston, who actually used the name black goo for the first time in relation to the claims, after which it stuck. He claimed in a television interview in 2014 that the black goo was a sentient liquid that responds to electrical stimuli. He would elaborate that this alien substance has been on Earth for millions of years, dormant and waiting to evolve once more. It's unclear if this trigger came from afar, whether it's pre-programmed into its genetic structure, or whether interaction with humans and the outside world will be the catalyst. What is clear, though, at least according to Johnston, is that while the Falklands War raged, the British military discreetly took control of this extraterrestrial liquid and returned it to the UK. It's claimed that several of the world's intelligence agencies and militaries had looked to get their hands on the substance, but the British military simply arrived and secured it first. It is claimed that the bulk of this was discovered on Toole Island. Thule Island, the southernmost of the South Sandwich Islands, is perhaps one of the most important locations of the Black Goo Conspiracy. It's claimed that it was here that an extraterrestrial race referred to as the Blues, whose appearance was essentially like the gray alien but with a blue color instead of gray, had set up a secret base of sorts, deep under the ground just after the First World War. And according to some sources, some high-ranking people in the Argentinian military were fully aware of this alien presence. According to whistleblowers, as well as researcher Alec Newald, who claims to have had direct contact with these blue aliens, they were attempting to deactivate this oily alien substance in the years leading up to the outbreak of the Falklands War. They had specifically chosen Thule Island due to its freezing cold climate, something which kept the black goo in a dormant state. 
Whether this was connected to the Argentinian government's decision to set up a scientific military base there in 1976 or not is open to debate. Some, though, very much believe it is. According to one witness, Juan Garcia, who served in the Argentinian Air Force, when Argentine re-established a military base on the island in 1976, it was more than just flexing of muscles on the international stage. He would tell UFO researcher David Griffin that from 1976 until the outbreak of the Falklands War in April 1982, there seemed to be an unseen force or agenda leading the darker sides to policy. It's also believed that both the United States and the United Kingdom were aware of this extraterrestrial aspect of the base. What is known for certain is that British forces attacked the base, using specially trained SAS units to do so. Furthermore, it's also been said that an underground facility was attacked and destroyed at the same time, a facility that would appear to be an extraterrestrial base. What is also interesting to note is that of the many papers relating to the Falklands War, only those concerning activity on Thule Island remain classified, even though they should have been released to the public several years ago. Perhaps adding a further dimension to this admittedly outlandish conspiracy are the claims that this alien substance, or certainly something connected to it, resides in Antarctica. It's interesting that the largely off-limits continent of Antarctica is easily accessed from the Falkland Islands. Once this substance was in the hands of the British, they returned it to the United Kingdom, where it was transported to a secret laboratory location. Their objective was to have scientists study this alien liquid, learn from it, and possibly figure out a way to weaponize it. It's here where researchers have suggested the Marconi scientists enter the frame. One such researcher who has investigated the Marconi deaths and the potential connections they might have to the Black Goo conspiracy is the previously mentioned David Griffin. It's his belief that they were likely working on the top-secret alien substance in their run-ups to their deaths. Griffin also highlights how many of the scientists' deaths were not only suspicious, but highly strange. It's said by some who've researched the black goo substance that it has the ability to affect the emotions and thought processes of people it's near to. Essentially, it potentially has the ability to take over a person's mind and decision-making process. This extraterrestrial fluid is said to have somehow escaped its environment, it's not clear if this was literally the case, and it used its own intelligence to flee, or whether it was somehow released, whether unintentionally or otherwise. What is clear, though, is once it was outside the confines of the laboratory, it took to the sewer and water systems, examining each germ and bacteria and learning and evolving by the second. Might this apparent leaking of this alien liquid into the wider world have been the catalyst that resulted in the Marconi scientists' deaths? Might they have been looking to break the story to the world, or were their deaths simply insurance to maintain absolute secrecy on the alleged experimental activities? One of the consequences of the Black Goo conspiracy was the creation of several top-secret programs that fell under both the United Kingdom's intelligence department and those of the United States, in particularly the National Security Agency NSA. The activities of this elite and ultra-secretive agency are not fully known, but it's believed that they were ultimately a clean-up assassination squad, and unwitting assassins at that, with claims of mind control being used on those who were recruited into the project. Were these apparent assassins used to neutralize those involved with the program who were considered a risk to the project's secrecy? One of those said to be connected to one of these programs Project Mannequin was the late conspiracy theorist and researcher Max Spears, although many believe it to have been nothing more than a tragic accident, including his family, there were certainly some suspicious circumstances surrounding his death, perhaps not least the claims that he vomited a black liquid in the hours before he died. Whether Spears was connected to the black goo conspiracy, even perhaps without his knowledge, is open to debate. There were rumors that he was onto something big before he died, and he also sent texts to his mother asking her to investigate his death if something was to happen to him. Only days after those texts were sent, of course, Spears was indeed dead. It hasn't escaped many researchers that 
Tales of Black Goo are one of the many story arcs of the X-Files, at times being the focus of entire episodes. And what's more, the backstory of this black goo, and indeed its qualities and agenda, match almost exactly to the claims of black goo connected to the Falklands War. Might the writers, directors, or producers of the X-Files have been trying to get information into the public through the fictional television show? Perhaps such an influence was more discreet and indirect. Maybe a person close to the show or the writers planted such an idea and gently encouraged such a story to be written. We might also consider that claims of the black goo, at least in part, be disinformation, and that is not to say that the people making such claims are untrustworthy, but rather that there is the possibility that sources that should be trustworthy may have in fact passed on purposely wrong information. We might recall the UFO researcher from the 1950s, Frank Scully, who was a remarkable researcher as well as genuine and credible. However, perhaps because of this, he was targeted with disinformation from people he had reason to trust. In short, anyone who has spent any amount of time researching or investigating any aspect of the UFO and alien question is more than aware that paths are littered with purposeful disinformation, and because of this, we should treat most claims with a certain degree of skepticism. That said, there is more than enough reason here to investigate the claims further and with a serious mindset. Without a doubt, the black goo conspiracy and the apparent connections to the suspicious deaths of the Marconi scientists have to be treated with a pinch of salt, and they are outrageous in nature. That said, there have been many conspiracies and claims that have appeared equally as preposterous to begin with that have proven to have had at least partial truths to them. With that in mind, we should perhaps not be in such a hurry to completely dismiss them as nonsense without at least further consideration, if only what any partial truths might actually have been. Why, for example, do the files on Thule Island remain classified when all others are in the public domain? It's clear that something happened there or is located there that the British military and government consider a security risk, at the very least. Might it be that there is something altogether stranger being covered up than most of us would be prepared to imagine. If there is any truth to the bizarre but disturbing conspiracy of the black goo and its potential connection to the Marconi scientists, then we need to evaluate just what is going on around us at any given time, as well as where this apparent alien substance might be today, and if an alien invasion is already taking place under our very noses. If you're interested in learning more about this, I've included a link in the show notes to an interview with David Griffin where he talks more about the black goo, the Marconi conspiracy, and more. The Freemasons, the Knights Templar, Skull and Bones, secret societies are already ripe for conspiracy theories. But what about the theory that they are also tied to extraterrestrials? We'll look into it when Weird Darkness returns. Remember staying up late at night while growing up, watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-horror movie or So Bad It's Good sci-fi flick from the 1950s? That's what the Monster Channel at WeirdDarkness.tv has to offer – all day, every day. You can visit WeirdDarkness.tv and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie. You can even invite your friends to watch with you and use the chat feature to talk about what you're watching and our monthly Weirdo Watch Party takes place there as well. Get your frights and funnies 24-7, 365 at WeirdDarkness.tv. When we think of the secret societies of the modern world, 
It's perhaps a bizarre suggestion that they might have their origins in ancient alien visitations in the distant past. However, the fact is many researchers independently of each other have highlighted several intriguing points that suggest just that. It's well documented, for example, that Masonic lodges and orders almost certainly sprang from the beliefs of the Knights Templar hundreds of years before, and that these Masonic-slash-Templar rituals almost certainly have their origins and are in fact almost identical to the rituals and teachings of the mysterious schools of such empires as ancient Egypt and Sumer. And according to some researchers, the origins of these mystery schools go back to an extraterrestrial race that arrived on Earth thousands of years ago. As outlandish and preposterous as that might sound to some, there just might be a connection between extraterrestrials who visited the planet thousands of years ago and the secret societies and how they influence world-changing events in the modern era. Even more amazing, at least some elements of these secret societies just might be aware and even have evidence of this alien presence, a notion that just might have been at the heart of one of the greatest achievements in human history – the moon landings. If you're not familiar with it, let's quickly touch on the basic story of the Anunnaki and their arrival on Earth thousands of years ago. Author Zechariah Sitchin had taught himself Sumerian cuneiform and ultimately went about translating a number of Sumerian clay tablets. These tablets, according to Sitchin's translations, told the history of the Sumerians, a history that stretched back almost half a million years. Essentially, an extraterrestrial race from a planet within our solar system, Nibiru, came to Earth in order to mine for gold, something they desperately required to fix their failing atmosphere. While they established their main presence in what is now modern-day Iraq, they mined gold in various places around the planet, including the Americas and Africa. However, this mining was grueling work, and the Anunnaki soon began to rebel against such tasks. The two leaders, two brothers named Enki and Enlil, decided they had to address the situation, and Enki, the scientist, opted to create a worker race, mixing their DNA with that of the most intelligent indigenous creature, which was Homo erectus or Neanderthals. The product of this mixing of genes was ultimately Homo sapiens, human beings. Kingdoms would be divided up among Anunnaki who resided on Earth, kingdoms that would essentially become the civilizations of the ancient world, such civilizations as ancient Egypt, Sumer, and that of the Indus Valley, as well as the suggestions of such advanced civilizations around such megalithic sites as Stonehenge in England or Gobekli Tepe in modern-day Turkey. In fact, it is in this region, also including modern-day Iraq or Mesopotamia and Egypt, where the first signs of human civilization are seen. This might suggest, as researcher and author Mike Barra highlights in his book Ancient Aliens and Secret Societies, which I will link to in the show notes, that one can see a steady progression from the mountains of Ararat, which of course is the alleged mountain where Noah's Ark is said to have come to a stop. It's interesting that many creation stories around the world tell of a time when gods lived on the earth, often only seen by royalty and high priests. These are likely retellings of the Anunnaki accounts. It is perhaps also interesting, parts of the story state that the Anunnaki used both the Moon and Mars as transportation hubs for the gold before it made its way to their home planet, and that the many anomalous buildings and claims of bases on the Moon and Mars are the remains of these transportation hubs. We'll return to this idea later. As the centuries went on and societies and civilizations were rebuilt and following several brutal wars between rival and Anunnaki relations, it was decided that the Earth would be divided into three specific regions that would be given to humans to rule over after concluding it was the will of the Creator of all. Within each of these kingdoms would be a place of residence for the Anunnaki, where they would oversee as gods. They would also have a small region of the planet where they would reside away from humans, although it doesn't state as much, some researchers have questioned whether this region might have been Mount Olympus and that the Anunnaki were the gods of ancient Greece as well. Certain humans would be selected as kings and queens to rule over humans, along with high priests for the Anunnaki, as well as being schooled in the ways of the Anunnaki and in the knowledge of the universe. 
it is claimed that this took place around 4000 BC, which would match very well with many ancient civilizations, particularly those in the ancient Egyptian, Sumerian, and Indus Valley regions. As Mike Barra writes, this is the moment of the creation of secret societies, and these secret societies contained the knowledge and wisdom of an ancient extraterrestrial civilization. What's also interesting, as noted by Barra, is that there appears to be a concept of a divine being, a creator of all, among the Anunnaki. It's interesting that Freemasons very much believe in a great architect of the universe, something not too dissimilar to a creator of all. Whether the Anunnaki eventually returned to their home planet or remained on Earth discreetly in the shadows of unassuming but influential families is not known. After all, if the Anunnaki were the gods of the ancient world, then, as per those legends, they would have had the ability to assume various forms, including that of a human being. This is perhaps a further interest when we consider that there are many suggestions that the Anunnaki had reptilian features, with some stating that they and alleged reptile entities are one and the same. Many who subscribe to the reptilian conspiracy suggest that these entities reside on Earth, while assuming the form of a human being. Whatever the truth of the matter, these traditions were passed down over generations, over thousands of years, and were even transplanted through selected individuals into other civilizations and empires across continents. If we fast forward a little over a thousand years to what is modern-day France, we see the formation of the Knights Templar in 1118. Although some researchers suggest the origins date back to the late 11th century, in fact, despite how little we know of the Dark Ages, it's highly likely that these secret societies continue to exist, albeit discreetly. What we do know is that shortly after their formation, officially to provide safe passage for the Crusades, they arrived in Jerusalem and appeared to immediately begin excavating under the Temple Mount. These excavations went on for almost a decade. When the Templar Knights returned to France a short time later, they suddenly grew in wealth, influence, and numbers. Many researchers question just what they discovered under the Temple Mount, whether it's connected to the mystery schools or relics of ancient times, or how they knew it was there in the first place. Whatever the truth of the matter, the Knights Templar would become one of the most powerful and influential organizations throughout much of Europe for almost 200 years. And while their number would grow, there remained only a select few who were privy to the inner circle and sacred rituals of the Templar Knights. However, following their hunting down and arrest by King Philip IV of France in 1307, many of the Templars fled and went underground, and they took their treasures and secret rituals with them. It's believed many arrived in Scotland and were responsible for the construction of Rosalind Chapel, a building that appears to be a reconstruction of Solomon's Temple, a building important to both Knights Templar and, later, the Freemasons, some of whom would emerge in Scotland several hundred years later. However, like the Knights Templar before them, there are indications that rituals and teachings of the Freemasons had happened long before the first official records of Masonic lodges. Many Freemasons of the 18th and 19th century were people who were in great positions of power and influence, both in Europe, perhaps particularly so in England, and then in the newly formed United States. It is no secret that many people in positions of power and influence, whether politically, in business, or in authority, are also members of secret societies, not least various Masonic lodges. And this influence appears to be one that crosses international borders, at least discreetly. Perhaps one of the most interesting to examine is the early days of the United States. No less than 14 United States presidents are known to have been Freemasons. Similarly, 13 of the 39 men who signed the United States Constitution were also Freemasons, as were 9 of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence. There are even several connections to ancient Egypt. For example, there is the Washington Obelisk, as well as the all-seeing eye that you can see on every dollar bill. If we accept for a moment there is a connection between secret societies of the modern world and ancient alien visitors and their teachings from thousands of years ago, we might wish to consider not only the particularly heavy Masonic influence on America's early years, 
but also the many strange incidents involving strange, supernatural phenomena that appear to have almost assisted the coming together of the country. Perhaps one of the strangest incidents to examine is that of the green-skinned warriors that visited George Washington at Valley Forge in 1777 during the battles with the British. These visitations were relayed by Anthony Sherman, who was with Washington at the time, and would speak of the encounters to several newspapers years later. According to the reports, these green-skinned entities would visit with Washington and offer advice on British troop movements, even advising the best place for Washington to launch attacks on the British regiments. It's also said they showed him visions of the future, of an America free from British rule. Whether these entities did actually assist George Washington or not is, of course, open to debate. Some researchers suggest these warriors could have been native tribes of the region who may have used bright green war paint. Others, though, believe the entities were a little more otherworldly. Another bizarre incident to consider occurred in the summer of 1814 in Washington, D.C. The United States soldiers were on the verge of defeat to the advancing British on what was a particularly hot day. Sensing their immediate victory, British soldiers began to set fire to buildings, which quickly began to spread, threatening to burn the city to the ground. Then, in the most bizarre way, the weather suddenly changed. Dark clouds appeared out of nowhere and unleashed a brutal downpour that put out the flames within moments. Then, similarly out of nowhere, a tornado formed and appeared to head straight for Capitol Hill, where many of the British soldiers were. Many of them were killed as the tornado ripped through, and the rest immediately retreated. Might there have been a helping hand in the creation of the United States? And might this help have come from ancient rituals passed down through generations of secret society members from the lands of ancient Egypt to the New World of America? And just who or what might some of those rituals summon? In fact, some of the most intriguing connections can be found in one of the United States' grandest moments. One conspiracy of sorts is the apparent Masonic connections to the moon landings, specifically the Apollo 11 mission. And once more, while we'll not go into much detail here, it's worth quickly reminding ourselves of those connections. One of the most intriguing, especially because it extends to both Freemasonry and ancient Egypt, is the involvement in the Apollo 11 mission of Farouk El Baz, who was involved in various crucial aspects of the mission, including the landing site and what precise time they would actually land on the moon. What is of interest, as well as his Masonic connections, El Baz's father was a leading authority on ancient Egypt and specifically ancient Egyptian rituals. Perhaps some of the most obvious signs of a purposeful Masonic mission being intertwined into the Apollo 11 mission and NASA as a whole is the number 33, which is, of course, representative of the 33rd degree Freemasons of the Scottish Rite, the very highest level of Freemasonry. For example, the launch pad from which the Apollo 11 mission began is named Launch Pad 33. This was something that was replicated when the first shuttle returned to Earth on Runway 33. Perhaps most intriguing of all, however, is the apparent Masonic ritual that Buzz Aldrin is claimed by some to have performed, exactly 33 minutes after the moon landing. In fact, Aldrin is the subject of further Masonic connections, not least as he is said to be a high-ranking member of the 33rd degree Scottish Rite Freemasons. Some researchers have claimed that, as well as the apparent rituals performed on the lunar surface, it's claimed that Aldrin left various Masonic gifts that contained various Masonic symbols. These were said to be an offering to Osiris. Rumor states he also took a silk Masonic scarf that was blessed on the moon, which he then gifted to the Scottish Rite Masonic Lodge in Washington, D.C. While the specifics of Aldrin's activities as a Freemason might be open to debate, his Masonic connections were well publicized at the time, with one particular article in the New Age magazine shortly after the Apollo 11 moon landing stating that masonry will be there when new worlds are reached. There's also another intriguing connection. James Edwin Webb, who acted as NASA's administrator from 1961 to 1968, right before the Apollo 11 mission. 
He was a known Freemason and is at the center of another conspiracy that could share a connection to what we're examining here. According to another of Mike Barrow's books, Ancient Aliens and JFK, The Race to the Moon and the Kennedy Assassination, which I will also place a link to in the show notes, James Webb not only had Masonic ties that cut deep into NASA, but he very well may have been connected to the assassination of President Kennedy in November 1963. Barra's argument is compelling, but essentially it is offered that Kennedy's desire to pursue a joint mission with the Soviet Union to the moon was ultimately what forced the hand of the shadow government that had retained increasing influence behind the scenes since the end of the Second World War to sign Kennedy's death warrant. According to Barra, the reasons that the powers that be, both in the shadow government and NASA itself, were so against such a mission with their Cold War nemesis was simple. There were extraterrestrial bases on the surface of the moon, the bases used by the Anunnaki thousands of years ago to ship gold to their home planet. One of those at the center of NASA and its upcoming missions was the aforementioned Webb, and according to Barra's research, there is reason to believe that Webb and other Freemasons were not only privy to information of what was on the moon, but they were also actively involved in the assassination of Kennedy in order to ensure that they, and only they, arrived at the moon first. Another person who also would have had a vested interest in the direction of NASA was Congressman Albert Thomas, who shared close ties with Vice President Lyndon Johnson, also a Texan, who we will turn our attention to in a moment. Because of his position, Thomas essentially had complete access to the finance and budget of NASA, and Thomas had made public his distaste at the idea of working with the Soviet Union. Although it is certainly not proof of his claims, Bora points to a very intriguing photo, which I will link to in the show notes, which appears to indicate that he very well may have been part of the plot to have Kennedy removed. Permanently. It was taken in the seconds after Lyndon Johnson was sworn in as president in the hours following Kennedy's assassination. In it, you can see Johnson has turned away from the camera and appears to be looking at none other than Texas Congressman Albert Thomas. His cheeks appear to be raised, as if he is smiling. Even more alarming is Thomas, who appears to be winking at the now President of the United States. What is perhaps also interesting, much like many of those involved with the Apollo 11 mission and the subsequent moon landing missions, both Webb and Lyndon Johnson were 33-degree Scottish Rite Freemasons. In fact, almost immediately upon taking the position with NASA, Webb began placing fellow Freemasons into prominent and influential roles within NASA, perhaps one of the most crucial being the manager of the Apollo program, Kenneth S. Kleinacht. If there was a plan to visit the moon in order to secretly explore and recover ancient Anunnaki bases on the moon that had been planned by the Freemasons, who had clearly navigated fellow Freemasons into key positions within NASA, then should someone appear to threaten that mission, even if it were the President of the United States, it's easy to see, as morally wrong as it is, that such a group would take the decision to remove such a threat. It's also important to note that even if these assertions are true, they are the plans and actions of individuals who happen to be Freemasons and not those of Freemasonry in general. Whether there is a connection between ancient alien bases on the moon, secret societies, and arguably the most infamous and debated murder of all time, that of President John F. Kennedy, remains very much open to debate. If there was any truth to these notions, it shows how seemingly unconnected conspiracies and legends tie together and snake out in various directions. What might these events have led to over the coming years? If there was any truth that at least some of those from secret societies have had more than a hand in world events, what else could have their collective fingerprints on it? There is, for example, speculation that the Strategic Defense Initiative, sometimes known as the Star Wars Project, was a result of some of the technology retrieved from the bases on the moon. What else, in our contemporary era, might be a consequence of this speculative discovery? Perhaps more than anything else, it demonstrates how many aspects of our reality connect in the most bizarre ways, ones that we would not at first expect to share any connections whatsoever. Could the secret societies of the modern world 
be teaching the same secret rituals and lessons as were imparted onto specifically selected high priests and royalty by alien beings thousands of years ago? And might these rituals have been continuously, if discreetly, passed down through generation after generation, crossing borders and infiltrating all aspects of life in almost all countries around the world? And if this notion is true, what should we make of the claims, outlandish as they might seem, that the same families and members of the elite have ruled over us from the shadows for thousands of years without our knowledge? There are plenty of researchers who have come to such conclusions, although their claims have usually fallen on largely dismissive ears. Indeed, if there is any truth whatsoever in the notion that such history-making incidents, such as the moon landings, are carried out by those with knowledge passed on by ancient aliens thousands of years ago, then we have to reevaluate our perception of the world around us and beyond. We have our own opinions about aliens and what their intentions might be, but what do the aliens think about us? And what do they think our intentions are? If one scientist is to be believed, it isn't flattering. That's up next on Weird Darkness. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. Dr. Stephen Greer, director of the Disclosure Project and the Center for the Study of Extraterrestrial Intelligence, believes there is irrefutable evidence of aliens visiting Earth. He made the statement in a recent interview with the Sophico program on RT. The ufologist claims that representatives of extraterrestrial civilizations have been conducting so-called reconnaissance missions for a long time. At the same time, according to him, Aliens are watching the development of mankind with caution, in particular regarding the development of weapons of mass destruction. However, Greer added that for 25 years he's been working on the disclosure of classified information regarding UFOs. The interviewer asked, Greer, according to you, we are not alone in the universe and there have already been many contacts between us and the aliens, but to most such statements will still seem strange. How can we prove once and for all that aliens exist and have already been discovered? A very good question, Greer answered. In general, this has already been done. In 2017, the documentary Unacknowledged was released. It's named after the first word in the phrase unacknowledged projects with limited access, as the U.S. military refers to top-secret programs related to UFOs and extraterrestrial life you will see that more than 950 military personnel with access to top-secret materials have testified, presented documents and photographs. We even conducted a study of a biological sample of extraterrestrial origin. There is irrefutable evidence of alien visits, and frankly, every participant in classified projects is aware of this. The public is not being told, wanting to keep everything under wraps for the sake of technology and petrodollar macroeconomics. 
This secrecy is not about so-called aliens, but about geopolitical influence and money, as usual. What about the version of the picture of the world Dr. Greer presents? Do aliens only come to us for a while, or have they already firmly settled here? Dr. Greer answers the question by saying, no, these are reconnaissance missions. Since we began to test atomic weapons, the number of visits of extraterrestrial civilizations to our planet has definitely increased. They are clearly worried about our ability to destroy and our weapons of mass destruction. In the modern period of sightings of so-called UFOs, their number has increased markedly after we developed nuclear weapons and the hydrogen bomb. This is a fact, and we have many witnesses who were involved in top-secret projects and were present at nuclear facilities where alien ships flew in to monitor our activities. Many people, in particular science fiction writers of course, have given us the idea of the risk of some kind of alien invasion or threat, but everything is quite the opposite. We are considered a threat. Now human civilization is perceived as unstable, unable to establish peace on the planet. This should have happened after the Second World War, but there is still no change for the better. I think extraterrestrial intelligence is waiting for our civilization to mature, and until then it will not take open action, unless there is some kind of catastrophe. The interviewer then asked, if some civilizations have mastered interstellar flight, then we can be considered just a retarded hole? Yes, Dr. Greer replied. But here's the problem. We're flying into space, aren't we? We have the ISS. We have sent unmanned vehicles to Mars, and in the future we will launch manned vehicles. We landed on the moon. By the way, my uncle helped design the lunar module that Neil Armstrong landed on. What I'm trying to convey to people is this. When we started to explore space and develop weapons of mass destruction, it became a signal that our civilization is at a certain stage of development and may present a problem. I think we are seen as an evolving but problematic civilization. So the main task of all mankind is to step out of the ape-like fragmented society in which we foolishly fight each other to the stage of peaceful coexistence when we fly into space for good purposes. When we reach this important milestone, other civilizations will be in contact with man much more openly. According to Dr. Greer, there is a special organization that keeps secret everything related to UFOs. But, after all, aliens would not be limited only to America, and then the authorities of other world powers would know about them, so would this indicate that there is some kind of international agreement? So do authorities of each country themselves determine the course in the field of alien contacts? Dr. Greer explains, This is a transnational organization. It is worth explaining the difference with an international structure such as the UN. For a transnational organization, there are no geopolitical boundaries. For example, there is documentary evidence that at the height of the Cold War, the KGB collaborated in this area with the American intelligence services. So this issue has been kept secret for decades by the joint efforts of a number of countries. But the lion's share of the work is done by the United States, simply because of its technological development and, admittedly, its huge macroeconomic influence. Later in the interview, Dr. Greer was asked, the documentary based on his book called Sirius begins with the claim that the power of the oil corporations is behind an unfair financial system that benefits only a handful of people and leaves the American middle class with nothing. Perhaps all the talk about UFOs is his way of expressing extreme dissatisfaction with what's happening in the real world. No, Greer answers, I'm just acknowledging the fact that our world is just a pale shadow of what it could be if we used technologies developed over the past half century in various classified projects. We use planes and cars, oil and gas, although we don't really need them. For the past few decades, we could already do without them. But it was concluded that the disclosure of new technologies would have a devastating effect on the current macroeconomic system. This discussion needs to be shared by all. People are increasingly concerned about issues such as climate change, air pollution, and related deaths. Such problems can be solved, but not with the help of solar or wind energy. It is necessary to use for the benefit of mankind bold scientific discoveries that have been studied for decades in the framework of top-secret projects. Dr. Greer also said, 
that U.S. presidents are not told about all such discoveries, and they even prepared a special briefing for Barack Obama and spoke before Congress. So, how did that go? I found that everyone wants to know the truth, Greer says. This is the biggest open secret in society. Even when I first prepared a briefing for President Bill Clinton and the director of the CIA, everyone was well aware of the existence of great secrets in this area. In America, elected officials generally do not have control over such projects. If you don't believe me, remember the words of Jimmy Carter after he became president and tried to sort out this matter. When asked what it was like to be the most powerful person in the world, he replied that it was not about him because certain things were not told to him and he did not control them in any way. However, we have been pandering for too long to interests that have become very undemocratic and endanger world freedom and even our very existence within the biosphere. I've already said that this level of secrecy has been a problem for the U.S. since Eisenhower, but it exists in other countries as well. If the UFO issue is kept so secret that even the presidents don't know, how is it that Dr. Stephen Greer is still alive then? Why is he allowed to, for example, make documentaries for Netflix? He's talking about uncovering a massive government conspiracy and the CIA has killed people for less. Dr. Greer responds to the statement with, Three people from my team were killed, including the former director of the CIA, but I would not like to go into details. However, we have measures in place to protect what we're working on. I've collected a lot of data and if anything happens to me, it'll be published on the internet, which will turn out to be a disaster for our opponents. We've been using this mechanism for about 20 years. In addition, I've met people working in the Pentagon and the CIA who, it seems to me, would be very happy with the publication of this information. There is no clear distinction between us and them. Many people from all over the world would like this information to be made public. My good friend Carol Rosen has worked closely with senior officials in Russia who want the same thing because they share our views. There are similar people in China and in Great Britain and in Canada. So there are definitely moves, but nothing will happen until people realize the seriousness of the situation and see the potential for solving environmental, governance, and economic problems around the world. The former Minister of Defense of Canada said that many alien races visit our planet, but no one has been able to provide tangible and irrefutable evidence. I wonder, how many eyewitnesses are required? Is it really necessary for a flying saucer to land on Red Square or near the Pentagon building for everybody to recognize the existence of extraterrestrial civilizations? No, not necessarily, says Greer, but people need to be properly educated on this issue. That's why we post popular science films and other products. Paul Hellyer, former Minister of Defense of Canada, is a good friend of mine, he says. I also brought him up to date, and we held a press conference with him in Toronto. There's a huge amount of such evidence, including irrefutable material. We have them, and I've been collecting them for decades. The only question is, who will tell about it? In the U.S., the situation is this. If any program begins to study in detail the evidence for the existence of UFOs, it will be closed, and everyone thinks that America has a free media. No, they are under control. If CNN started digging deep, it would be told to stop. I've already seen this. We partnered with ABC News, and I gave them 35 hours of highly classified evidence and hard evidence. However, the channel's executive producer was banned from releasing such material. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can also email me anytime with your questions or comments through the website at WeirdDarkness.com. That's also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks that I've narrated, shop the Weird Darkness store, sign up for the email newsletter to win monthly prizes, find other podcasts that I host, and Find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Plus, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. 
the alien black goo invading Earth, and Secret Societies and Ancient Aliens were written by Marcus Louth for UFO Insight. Aliens Consider Us a Threat to the Galaxy is from Animalian. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 2 verse 10 For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And a final thought from C.S. Lewis. The long, dull, monotonous years of middle-aged prosperity or middle-aged adversity are excellent campaigning weather for the devil. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the weird darkness.